<laughs> we are here for one purpose today, and that is to discuss, quite frankly, TPA. There are some things we'd like to talk about first, including Jerry and Jim's overall thoughts on TPA administration, personally and professionally. And then I'd like to segue into a recent controversial piece the entire medical community is buzzing about right now. Uh, emergency medicine physicians, neurologists, cardiologists, advanced practice providers, and the New York Times. So first, Jerry, I'm going to let Jim ask you um, some very direct questions uh, and get everything out on the table. Great. Well, Jerry, thanks so much for being here. <coughs> Appreciate thanks. it. Uh, thanks you for are having me. an expert, and even the New York Times thinks you're uh, charismatic and riveting. So. <laughs> yes. But I think those are code, code words for a snake oil salesman, that's, that's is what, right. what so they meant by it. <laughs> you should rivet us uh, <laughs> today. Uh, I'm sure you know more about TPA than I do, but um, just a sort of a basic understanding of it. There are about 12, I believe, placebo controlled randomized studies on TPA, uh, and two of them at least in the, um, the analysis by the authors, show a benefit for TPA, the NINDS2 and the ECAS3 study. Right. All the other ones show either no benefit or harm. And despite this, this drug has a 1A recommendation by the American Heart Association and is, by the way, one of the number one causes of emergency physicians being sued is not giving TPA. Um, I don't think I've seen any that have been sued for problems with TPA, but for not giving TPA. So, um, how did this how did this happen? How did this drug get to be a one A recommendation with so much negative uh, d data on it, and minimally, and depending on how you interpret it, positive data? Well, that's a really interesting question. The reason I, you know, a, a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, know that I've been involved in this for a long time with this TPA for stroke we're, we're talking about. We're not talking about thrombolytics for MI, where there's a lot more data. But for stroke, as you say, most of the data is negative, and even the positive data, one could argue whether it's actually truly positive. Uh, how did it happen? I can't, you know, I can't read anybody's mind, but it seems to me there are two reasons why um, this may have become uh, popular therapy. One is because stroke is a really bad thing, and some people who have a stroke uh, end up with um, a bad outcome, and traditionally we feel like there isn't much we can do about it. That turns out not to be actually true. There's a lot you can do for the care of stroke patients, but none of it's glamorous. It's all basically nursing care, uh, making sure that they don't get a fever, that if they have a fever, you give them acetaminophen and, and take the fever down, that you uh, keep their head up 15 degrees, that you do all the, the basic things, early rehab, all those have been shown to have a really important uh, impact on stroke, stroke outcomes, but they're not glamorous. And since a lot of people have bad outcome, uh, it can be very frustrating. So when somebody came along and said, we have a new magical wonder drug that makes it all great, uh, I think one of the motivations here is that we want to believe that. We'd like to believe we can do something, not feel nihilistic, Etc. The other motivation, I, I think, and uh, I say it to say this, but I think is money and profits. This is a very expensive drug, and it has very powerful people pushing it, including people who most of us think of as neutral, like the Heart Association, the Stroke Association, but they also get lots and lots and lots of money from the manufacturer. I was part of this process. I was invited to be part of the Heart Association uh, panel that discussed this. And, you know, I, I um, was the sole uh, voter that it shouldn't be a Class 1A recommendation. I was also one of only two people on the panel who wasn't taking money from the manufacturer. Um, when I uh, when I was invited to be part of it, I was pretty skeptical because I, I knew they were going to vote that way because I knew who was on the panel and I knew what they all thought. But I was asked to participate and told, don't worry, listen, it's really important that we participate, you participate, the panel will, will do what they do, but the larger group, the Heart Association itself, we need to hear from you because we'll make the ultimate decision. And um, it turned out that wasn't really true. They did whatever the panel said. And <laughs> interestingly enough, I was invited to write a minority report, and I did write that minority report and sent it in, never heard, never heard, never heard, and then eventually was um, I, I finally got hold of one of the people who asked me to write the minority report and said, what's happening with that? And he said, well, we don't have room to publish it. it must have been too long. So it was too long. It wasn't very long. It was a few pages. But I said, okay, here's the deal. I'll, I'll Give me one page. I'll write one page and publish that. And they said, no, 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 we don't have room. And I said, well, how about a paragraph? 
And they said, we don't have room. And I said, okay, how about you just put on this thing, here's the panel, here's the report. One member of the panel, Dr. Hoffman, disagrees. And they said, we don't have room. And then they um, sort of took my name off the panel. It was interesting, they not only didn't put me on the majority report, <laughs> but when they reported which were the various panels in that year's Heart Association meetings, my name was disappeared. So <laughs> I was whitewashed from the whole discussion. Well, there's no question that money and medicine uh, live together. And I remember when TPA first came out, if you thought about the drug and didn't uh, use it, they'd still pay you if you opened up the bottle and mixed it up. And um, it cost about $5,000 a number of years ago per dose to the hospital. I'm not sure what it costs about now, but uh, I, it is a very expensive drug. For sure. And, and Genentech, the company that brought it out, spent millions and millions of dollars uh, in, in getting doctors to write. Ar all these articles that are written about are all supported by Genentech. I mean, yeah. So, you know, for me, Jim, <clears throat> uh, I think if we were to look at all the data, there isn't that much data. I think the data strongly suggests that this is not useful in stroke and that it probably does a little more harm than good. Um, but I, I don't think we can be definitive because unlike with uh, STEMI, there, there's only very limited data. The reason I feel passionately about this is not because I think we're killing lots and lots of patients by using this drug. I think probably on the margins, it's a little bit harmful better than, than nothing. But the reason I think it's important is because I think it's sort of a, a poster child for the way in which money um, gets us to do things that are unproven and makes the general world believe that something has been proven when it hasn't. And that's, to me, very, very scary. The way in which money um, biases opinions of many, many doctors who don't know the, the actual data. I spend a lot of time looking at this data. Um, most of us don't have the time to look at all the data, and yet we get led by the nose because there's a lot of money selling this stuff. And I bet if you ask these doctors, did the money influence you or did your honorarium influence you? They say, of course it did not. I, you know, I, of course. I do it all based on science and so on. It's very powerful, very subtle. And um, uh, it's amazing how that works with the antibiotics, uh, choice of antibiotics and uh, seizure drugs. And look at, look at Lyrica and Neurontin. I mean, very minimal benefit even in the studies that support it, yet it's one of the 10, they're one of the ten leading used drugs in the country. How about Tamiflu? I mean, there's yeah. so many examples. <clears throat> there's a huge literature, as, as you know, Jim, and Martha knows as well, that uh, showing that uh, most doctors, most people who take the money th have to feel like it's not influencing them. There's this concept of cognitive dissonance. If you felt like you were being bought for a few bucks for a pizza, you'd, you'd feel really bad about yourself. So you have to believe that I'm not doing it for that reason. I really believe the science. But there's a huge literature showing that money has a tremendous impact on what we do. And when, re when you do take the money, it changes your behavior. When you take the money as a researcher, it changes your conclusions. It changes your science. It isn't just this is pure science. I'm sorry. That's not true. Yeah, and a lot of drug companies have some influence on what's written in the articles, too. So. Of course they do. Yeah. Would you say then, as a sort of an overall opinion, you don't think the TPA is beneficial at all and should not be given and that it has potential harm because of the uh, I, I think the, the, data? Best, the best you can say from the data <clears throat> is that um, with the limited data we have, it, the, the actual effect on outcome in stroke is probably somewhere between a little bit of harm and a, maybe a marginal teeny bit of good. Exactly where on that spectrum it is, I don't know. I think the best bet is probably marginal harm. I'm pretty sure we can say, almost certainly, that it doesn't do important good. I'm, I'm pretty sure we can rule out that this is really important for doing good. It might do a minimal amount of good. I think that's unlikely, but I can't say it's impossible. But yeah, I, I think the best look at the data right now is probably neutral or a little bit of harm. Uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, about how doctors kind of come down on one side. The neurologists who used to just say, I'll see them in the morning, now are the big advocates. And emergency physicians now uh, are, are considered uh, heretic because they, they question the use. And as I said, the, m the medical legal aspect of it is tremendous. But I, I will say, you know, over the years, because uh, people know that my position on this, I have received probably a couple of dozen emails or phone calls from neurologists saying, 
help me. I, they want me to do this, and I don't think it works, and I don't want to do it. But in the world of neurology, you can't really say that out loud. So, <laughs> so Emergency medicine has a little more independence, I think, in some of these yeah. other specialties. But do you think then that another study, particularly a placebo-controlled study, will never be done? I don't think it'll be done. You know, uh, there's a famous quote from uh, Elliot Grossbart, who is the vice president of was at the time the vice president of Genentech when they were arguing between TPA and streptokinase for STEMI. And at that time, um, TPA owned the market. But there was a lot of reason to believe that streptokinase, one-tenth the cost, was just as good. And um, when the feds decided that they needed to do another study, another comparative trial of the two, there's a famous quote from him saying, it might be a good thing for the American people, but it can't be a good thing for Genentech. It'll, we shoot ourselves in the foot. If we win, we haven't gained anything. And if we don't win, oh my God, that would be terrible. So the answer to your question is, I, I'd be very surprised if they did another study. And of course, if they really believed it worked, that's what they should do. And well, I'm the chairman of our institutional IRB, Institutional Review Board. I'll guarantee you such a study would never be allowed in our hospital because everyone would say it's been proven, it has a 1A recommendation, yeah. and nobody would dare touch a study like that. Yeah, it's, so it's the, the two studies that were positive, the, the NINDS2 and the ECAST, have been thought to be flawed in the interpretation of some of the data. Uh, you have uh, just a few thoughts on on. Yeah, just just very briefly, um, we Dave Schreiger and I did a reanalysis of the NINES study, which is by far the most positive. It's often uh, people often quote it as showing a 33 percent benefit, but that's the relative benefit. The absolute benefit was about 12 percent using the metric that they used, and we we actually it took me years to get the data. I, I filed FOIA requests and eventually got the data, the individual data from the NINES trial, and we said, you know, this doesn't take into account. Their, how severe the stroke was. And it turns out that the TPA group and the placebo group had differences in the level of severity of strokes. For example, 4% uh, of the placebo patients had the least mild category of stroke, and 19% of the TPA patients had the least mild category of stroke. There's a 15% difference in that. And that by itself, you know, the, how severe your stroke is, the biggest predictor of your outcome. So how can you look at the outcomes? The outcomes were 13% better, but they started out 15% better. When we actually put that into the equation and looked at the change in neurologic function uh, between before you got the drug and after the drug, it didn't look like there was any. So let's go back for a second. There are a lot of trials if, in fact, the, the effect is just about zero, what you'd expect if you do 10, 12, 15 trials is that most of them will look like it's neutral, a couple of them will look negative, and a couple of them will look slightly positive. That's what we have here. In this case, when you go back and actually look at the baseline severity of stroke, and even in the other one, ECAS-3, there was a difference in baseline severity. If you take that into effect, it looks like there were none that were actually positive. But even if that weren't true, at best, you'd have a couple of studies with marginal benefit, ECAS-3 much less benefit, only 6% absolute benefit, a couple of studies with marginal benefit, a bunch of studies that are neutral, and a couple of studies that are harmful. That's what you'd expect to see if it was a neutral drug or a little bit harmful. Right, and uh, as you said, the, the final outcome of a stroke is almost is mostly uh, based on the how presentation, bad the how was. bad the stroke is. Yeah. If you have a really bad stroke, you're not going to get back to a, a zero or a one. So we uh, reanalyzed the, the NIND data, and we did all of that stuff. We looked at it overall, and there, there seemed to be exactly the same effect in the TPA and the placebo group. In addition, uh, when you looked at the severe strokes, most of the severe strokes did terribly. A few severe strokes in the TPA group did well, but a few s severe strokes in the placebo group did well, and they were about the same. If you looked at the mild strokes, most of them did fine. A few of them in the TPA group did poorly, and a few in the placebo group did poorly. Again, if you graphed the outcomes according to where they started, the, the graphs overlap. And it's, you can't tell which, is, which was in the TPA group versus the other when you look at the graphs together. Right, so the bottom line is if a patient or their family comes in with a stroke and they say, I've heard about this drug TPA, and they usually hear good things about it. Uh, even the New York Times said it's been proven to uh, be a value for many stroke patients. I know what you tell doctors. What, what do you think the, the doctors ought to tell the, the patient of the family, particularly since medical legally, they're on really thin ground 
uh, when there's a really bad outcome of a bad stroke to begin with? Well, you know, as you know, uh, the, what you need for a lawsuit, the most important thing you need is a bad outcome, and strokes have a lot of bad outcomes. So if you want to have a lawsuit, um, take care of a stroke patient who's going to do poorly, and you, you're setting yourself up. And so obviously it takes some courage to uh, recommend against this. I, I personally think, you know, I know a lot of doctors who say they agree with me, ER doctors who say they agree with me, but, you know, it's much easier. Just the neurologist is going to be there, let them do it, and it's their business. And I understand that. But I personally feel like I have an obligation to my patients. These are my patients. So I do try to talk to the family. I don't tell them this is bad stuff. I tell them there's going to be the stroke team's going to come down, and they're going to tell you how great it is, but I just want you to know it's very controversial. And I want you to know the following facts. Not everybody agrees it works. Not everybody agrees it's been proven. It certainly doesn't decrease mortality. It's not going to keep grandpa alive. The reason people are pushing it is because they think it'll make it better in function six months from now. But that's controversial. Oh, and by the way, it also does increase the chance that you'll have bleeding into your brain. And when you bleed into your brain, that's a really big deal. It happens about 6% of the time. Half of those go on to have a really bad outcome. And most of the studies suggest that that increases your chance of dying. That's what I tell them. They often will then come back to me and say, well, what would you do? And I, I, I try my best not to answer that. I say, it's not what I would do. It's what you would do. I just want you to understand that this is controversial, might increase mortality, certainly doesn't decrease mortality. And um, in my experience, many, many people then say, we don't want it. Yeah, now, it's always good if you can turf it to a neurologist. Martha, for example, works in a hospital where there is no neurologist. So she, as a nurse practitioner, has to make, along yeah. with the input from the doctors, has to make that decision. Uh, and that's a, that's a lot of, of uh, heaviness on the, the doctor because you know uh, that what the data is Yet, you know, the patients don't know what the data is. They, they want the doctor to tell them what they think is right. Right. And, but, you know, i, I got to say here, Jim, that I think we spend too much time worrying about getting sued. The truth is that if you practice long enough, you're going to get sued. Um, but you're not going to get sued a lot. And most of the time, it's going to go away. And rarely you might have to go to court. It's very, very rare. And most of those cases, you're going to win. And I've testified in a whole bunch of TPA for stroke uh, cases. And the defendant won in essentially every one of them, unless the care was really, really bad. So um, yes, you are increasing your chance of being sued. But I don't think we should spend all our time worrying about that. I think we should care about doing the right thing for our patients. So I'm not a believer in saying we're not going to offer this, even though I think in a more rational world, it wouldn't be offered. It, it wouldn't have been approved. It, it's not been proven. But in our world, it is approved and we have to offer it. But even with a neutral presentation, followed by the neurologist is going to come down and tell them how great it is, many people just hearing that, wait a second, it might not be as good as they're telling you, many people become skeptical. So continuing on the controversial road here, let's move on now to the piece published in the New York Times. For our listeners, this was published on March 26, 2018 by Gina Collada, entitled, For Many Strokes, There's an Effective Treatment. Why aren't some doctors offering it? Now, we know there are many things, Jerry, that you want to comment on in this article. But let's start off by having one question asked here. And I'm just going to ask this one question here. Would you be less upset about this piece if it had been entitled, For many strokes, there's a possible treatment. Why aren't doctors offering it? Well, sure, but uh, that that's only one of the big problems in this article, and I'm sure we'll get into some of them. Um, I was uh, asked to speak to this uh, woman, whom I she's a main reporter for the New York Times Health uh, part, and I've read a lot of her stuff in the past, and uh, I've always haven't been always impressed by uh, what she writes. I, I I think she's written a lot of very pharma friendly pieces in the past. But in any case, and I was warned by friends of mine uh, not to talk to her, but I thought that's ridiculous. I, I'll talk to her and I'll do my best. Um, I was uh, introduced to her and she was introduced to me by someone from the University of Toronto who I'm pretty sure had his best intentions and he had uh, communicated to her that this was controversial. And she said, oh, I didn't know it was controversial. I never heard it was controversial. It's sort of amazing because she's written about this in the past. But I thought, you know, let's let's uh, let's see where we go, and I'll I'll tell her uh, as well as I can what I think is going on. 
And then uh, we can talk about the article, what she said and what she should have said. But certainly she should have said possibly, instead of saying it was, why she had uh, uh, appointed herself the arbiter of this, the scientific arbiter. What's her credentials to decide? If there's a scientific controversy, who is she to tell us which is the right side? But she, she uh, obviously self-appointed herself. Well, concerning the title, uh, what sells books and movies and most other things is the catch line that someone reads. So if this said, well, there's some controversy about the stroke drug, uh, yeah, who would read it? You know? Well, you know, you, you certainly could. I, I don't pretend to know, but one might imagine that <clears throat> you might have readers if you said, you know, this thing has been has been put out there, advertised as the greatest thing ever, magic, but you know what? It turns out it might not be. I think you'd probably get some readers, but that wasn't her goal, I don't think. Right. Um, so, you obviously disagree that uh, there's an effective treatment. It's questionable. Maybe a little bit of help, maybe a little bit of harm. Yet, uh, this article is very slanted towards the use of the drug and calls the people who use it as uh, bloggers and uh, yeah. social medias without yeah. telling any science. I mean, when I read that part of it, I was very taken back. I thought that was kind of crazy, particularly since, uh, you know, some of your stature was uh, being quoted. But um, it, it's quite it's quite interesting that the neurologists, here's what they say, and they're right. And then these crazy ER doctors who, right. who, who don't know what they're doing. Yeah, so this was, the, you know, this is a little bit of a hatchet job, and it's really defamatory. So uh, she calls them experts. And she re repeatedly refers to the people who are pushing this as experts. She didn't mention that the people she quotes uh, are taking lots and lots of money from industry. Uh, she didn't think that it was important for her readers to know about that potential conflict of interest. On the other hand, she doesn't call any of the, the skeptics experts, and she paints us as, as uh, either me, I'm charismatic, which I think means I'm a snake oil salesman, or the people who might agree with me as sort of uh, mindless, sheep-like followers who don't know anything but social media. It's sort of funny because I had talked to her about that, and I let her know that I... I've never. I don't know what Twitter is. I I don't use social media. Yeah, we don't see you tweet very often. <laughs> I have nothing to do with any of that stuff. And then I've published lots of articles in the peer-reviewed literature about it. But she ignores all that, and she she makes it out as though there's these mindless doctors, and and she quotes the the advocates as saying, "Oh, those ER docs who object, they don't know anything. They don't know the literature." Now. Did she fact check? Did she find out if that was true or not? This is outrageous that she did made no effort to fact check any of the things that she did. Um, she also, <laughs> she didn't mention that uh, the, all the conflict of interest of the people who are advocating for this, but she pretended that I had a conflict of interest. So she wrote in the original article that I was selling informational tapes pushing my theory. And that, there's a lot of code words in there. So informational is sort of like infomercials. Wait, no, wait a second. I, I'm, I've been participating in continuing medical education. That's a informational. It's not a theory. It's a critical analysis of what the data is. Uh, all of that is so distorted and so code wordy to make us think that I'm just sort of selling this stuff. I asked her afterwards, I said, w I didn't sell anything. And she said, I never accused you of selling. And I, I sent her the, the the paragraph in which she says he's selling this and she said oh that's a misunderstanding I was like excuse me wait a second that's not a misunderstanding you wrote it so then she says well did you give away the tapes as though um, she's now again accusing me of selling them so I said to her would you what would you think if I wrote that you were selling your theory in a national newspaper because the New York Times paid you and she said, oh, well, now that you've explained it, and she agreed to write a retraction, but that was only after I sort of threatened the Times. Did she, in fact, write a retraction? They did write a retraction, but it wasn't, it wasn't a very good one. It was, she, yeah. she still used the word informational and my theory. You know, I mentioned to her, why are they experts? Emergency physicians are experts in clinical medicine. Oh, and by the way, I'm fairly well known as an expert in science, in methodology, in study design. And that's what this is really about. It's not about clinical expertise. It's about how do you read the literature. And none of the people she quoted as advocates are experts in methodology. But of course, she ignored that. So a lot of this was an attempt to paint. I've always, <laughs> it's always interesting to me when people 
act as though I have pulled the wool over all these stupid doctors who just believe all this other stuff. A, I'm not capable of that. But B, that's a real insult, not just to me, but to all the people who say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. It's a real insult. And it's defamatory. And it's it's truly outrageous. Well, I know you had a, you've had a lot of support from emergency medicine folks. Have you had any contact with neurologists in one one way or the other uh, over this particular article? Yeah. So I've uh, you know I I have had uh, I've been at you know uh, conferences where this is discussed and debated with neurologists, and some of them say you're killing people by getting people not to use this drug as the, again as though it's my fault. I I somehow magically have gotten people to do stupid things. First of all, the idea that we're killing people is crazy because there's no evidence anywhere, zero, period. No one has ever been able to make the claim that this saves lives. So it has nothing to do with killing people. But that's one thing. There are neurologists who think anybody who is skeptical is, is harming patients. And they have the right to believe that. I think that's wrong, but they have the right to believe that. Um, I have, as I mentioned, I've heard from a, a handful, a bunch, probably a couple of dozen neurologists who believe the opposite. So it, it's not like they're they're all of the same mind, but their their culture makes it hard for them to speak out in public and say we don't believe this. Certainly, many many emergency physicians are skeptical, but not all. There are some emergency physicians who think this is a, a good idea. You know, when we don't know the truth, when data isn't um, definitive, and it's hardly ever that we have completely definitive data, but here we have so little data, you know, we can only make our best get. I think to accuse somebody else of malice because they disagree with you is, is not appropriate. Joe, you said there was a difference in baseline severity in the NINS trial. Would you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, when you looked at the placebo group versus the TPA group, the TPA group had far more mild strokes and fewer severe strokes than the placebo group. And I pointed that out to this reporter, Gina Collada, and she dutifully mentioned in her piece that I said there was a baseline difference. And then after she writes that, the next sentence is, the experts disagreed. And afterwards, I wrote her an email. I had a long email exchange with her, which is quite comical. But one of the things I said is, what does it mean to disagree with a fact? I had shown her, this was not something I made up, 4% versus 19%, that's very different. I had shown her that this was reported by the NINS authors themselves. So what does it mean when you say they disagreed with my theory that there was a baseline difference. There was a baseline difference. We live in a world now where when you're caught in a lie, you just say fake news. And that's what this reminded me of. Yeah. Well, um, I can say that uh, stroke is a very uh, damning disease, and it's devastating to the, not only the patient, but to the family to have someone who has a bad stroke, the outcome likely going to be bad. Um, they're thinking about nursing homes and bed sores sure. and feeding tubes and tracheostomies and all those sort of other things. Let's just give it a try. Maybe it'll help. Uh, even if it kills him, he's probably better off dead. I've heard patients uh, sure. say that sometimes. Sure, and I have no problem with the notion that there are things worse than death. And, you know, if it was a choice of dead or normal, you know, we can make him normal. Otherwise, he'll be miserable. I can understand people uh, making that choice, risking death to try to get a better outcome. But the notion that it can't hurt is really silly because not only could it kill patients, but it could also make them worse, breed into rain and have a worse, more vegetative outcome. And you mentioned the randomized trials. Most of the randomized trials are negative, but there's also data that are about uh, effectiveness, not efficacy. What happens in the real world? And the industry itself, sponsors have published a few effectiveness studies claiming that they had good outcomes. Those studies are, uh, we don't have time to go over their many, many biases and flaws, but there are also a large number of non-sponsored effectiveness studies, and in those, the outcomes are really, really terrible, worse than in stroke in general. More deaths, but even more important, more bad neurologic outcomes. People left vegetative and doing very poorly. So. I don't think we should, I understand the impulse to say, let's just try it because we don't want to have a bad outcome. That would be reasonable if everybody had a bad outcome without therapy. But a lot of people have a pretty good outcome and you can ruin their lives by doing a therapy that is not only not helpful, but is harmful. That's my big concern. One of the things that I think the, the viewers 
need to know is not all these patients are taken care of by some board certified uh, with a specialty in stroke neurologist at the University Medical Center. I know the Cleveland Clinic looked at this a number of years ago, and they found that the intracranial hemorrhage rate was 16%, not the 6% that the INDS study had, and that uh, 50% of them were given it inappropriately. Time, dose, uh, even, the, you know, was about 20% stroke mimic that, uh, that and you their, can give it to. And their neurologic outcomes, even aside <clears throat> from intracranial hemorrhage, were terrible. And it's not just the Cleveland Clinic. Yale did one where they looked at every patty in Connecticut who got it. The outcomes, again, large numbers of hemorrhage, large numbers of death, large numbers of terrible neurologic outcomes. And there's one from Michigan which looked at the entire state of Michigan, same thing. And there's one which took a national database with 100,000 patients. And again, the outcomes were awful, often inappropriately used, but even when it wasn't inappropriately used, the outcomes were way worse than the placebo group in NINs. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I would do if I had a really bad stroke and I was awake enough to make a decision whether I would say, well, what the heck, I got nothing to lose except I might just die and I'm supposed to be on this bed for the next 10 years with a, with a peg and a trach. So, I'm not sure what I would do. Uh, yeah, I, I've you, given it and I've not given it. Right. And um, I don't think, there's, unfortunately, we don't know enough. I, I used to answer that question, what would you do? I, said, I, I used to say, I would like, I, my wish would be that I was a participant in a randomized trial of this so that we would know what to do. But actually today, given all the subsequent evidence we have, um, even if I was in a bad state... I wouldn't want it for myself or for my wife or my family because I think it increases the chance that I won't get better. Well, you certainly uh, took a lot of uh, um, criticism from the New York Times, and the, uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. you know, your, your response to that is quite academic and very reasonable. We, we, we uh, understand uh, your points, and it's still controversial by many doctors, obviously not controversial on your part. Um, no, I think it's controversial. I, I think we don't know enough, and I wish we, we knew more. I don't think we're ever going to know more. So we, right now, until we know more, we still have to decide what to do. And I think the best guess today is not a positive one. All right. Well, we really thank you for being here, and special thanks to Miller Herbert and the rest of the crew uh, at his home today for, uh, for M using the MRAP resources to make this possible. Thanks again, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Good, good seeing you again. Great. Thank, thanks to both of you, and pleasure to be here.